Hi everyone, um, welcome to the tutor q and um, I'm Beth, I'm now, I've just finished my second year of engineering at St Hilda's College um, and kind of answering your questions today is Antoine, a professor of mechanical engineering. So do you want to just kind of like introduce yourself any more? Yeah. Than Hello everybody, I'm um, a professor of mechanical engineering. Uh, I'm a tutor also in, um, in St Hilda's College. And I've been in Oxford for close to eight years now, nine years. So everybody, hi. Nice. I think so. I imagine quite a lot of people will kind of want to know, I guess, to start with what an engineering tutorial is. And so maybe it might be worth kind of describing that first. Sounds good. Um, so, I mean, typically you'd have, uh, and Beth, feel free to, to interrupt me if, uh, if you, you feel like there's, there's additional detail that, that needs to be provided, especially from your perspective. Um, so typically, uh, at least first and second years, you'd be taking the main lectures uh, in the department, uh, but depending on which college you're, uh, you are in, uh, you will then uh, be having uh, uh, with generally by two or three students uh, one hour tutorial for every four lectures that you have with um, one of the tutor of your college. Um, and you'll generally go over um, question, question sheets, and that you'd have to prepare before and potentially hand over uh, your solutions to, um, to the tutor. Uh, and you'll be discussing essentially how you answer those questions and uh, if there's any challenges that you, you, know, you had during, uh, in, in the process, if you have any remaining questions um, in, in that respect. Um, I think I covered it, most of it, Beth, you? Yeah. yeah, that sounds good. I think one of the things that I find really good about tutorials is that if you didn't get it, you kind of feels like a safety net because you know that you're gonna go through it with someone that really knows what they're talking about. And so kind of like having that quite close contact teaching can be really, really good. Um, and also if you did get it, you can often find so many different ways of solving the same problem. Um, and so that's also like a really good thing I think about um, tutorials. But another question we've had through, I think- Just one we, thing to add, you know? uh, Beth, in that respect. Uh, I think tutorial, one important thing about tutorials is that those are not mini exams, right? This is the occasion for the, the student to discover what they understood well or not, and sometimes they, you know, you get to the right solution, but your your approach is totally wrong. So it's it's all about exposing the way you're thinking to the tutor to make sure that you understand the process. So the the end goal is not the solution. The end goal is understanding the the topic, um, and that's 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 why we're doing these tutorials. Yeah, definitely. And I think you realise that as you go through first year, like beginning, you might be a little bit like, oh, my God, this is a bit stressful. And then as soon as you get in there, it's just a conversation um, with someone that really likes the subject. So it can be really good and really useful. I think it's built my confidence a lot talking about kind of all my solutions and things like that as well. Um, and so that's been really good. But yeah, so another question that we've had is what's your favourite thing to teach within the engineering course? Um so that's a question I had um, earlier already on, on, the, um, on, on the chat. Um, uh, the way it works is that, so we are obviously a bunch of academics within the department. Almost all of us are associated to different uh, uh, colleges. And uh, we tend to, to teach in the topic that we're proficient in. So uh, I'm a mechanical engineer. I would tend to teach at the departmental level everything that has to do with either my research topic or you know solid mechanics or mechanics of materials, this kind of stuff. And the same way in the college, we're you know we are a three tutorial fellow, um, one who's uh, more in, into control, um, the other one who is more in, in another topic. Uh, you know sometimes we have postdocs that pitch in that are yet in other topics and myself i'm in mechanical engineering so i tend to do the tutorial that are related to materials mechanics of materials etc so we're in a lucky position as as tutor to actually teach in the topics of interest to us in in our research um though there are top, there's things like math where we teach math which is useful for pretty much everything that that uh, we end up teaching whether we are mechanical engineer or you know uh computer science, it's, uh, et cetera. Yeah, I think that is really good. 
um, kind of like you know that when you're being taught by a tutor that they have a very solid background most of the time in that subject and so you can obviously go a lot deeper then into the topics than your course necessarily takes you to if it's something that you find really particularly interesting um, at least what I've found anyway um, and that's been really good. Yeah, I agree um, with that. Yeah and so I guess kind of like coming on from maybe to do with tutorials, but someone's asked about how often do students interact with tutors? So there's, there's the, I'd say there's the official interaction in, in your college where, as I said earlier, you know, every full departmental lecture, you end up having uh, a one hour uh, tutorial session. Normally there's two to three students uh, at the time uh, in, quite often, well, most of the, the time in the, um, in the college office of, of the tutor. Uh, but there's also informal interaction, I'd say, that I personally have with, my, with uh, the student in, in my college where uh, there might be you know, questions about what they want to do uh, for their career, what options they might want to take um, if we have you know, connection with the industry or with other um, universities if they're interested in academia. So there's there's very much a relationship that's being established between the uh, the tutor and the tutee, let's say, uh, which which goes beyond the idea of just evaluating somebody and you know giving them a pat in the back. Uh, it, it's more about accompanying that person through the three to four years um, and helping them through their uh, I wouldn't say career choices, but Curses choices to some extent, and eventually to their career choices when, when they finish. Uh, so how often do you interact where uh, one, tut one tutorial every four lectures and all the, you know, added email um, coffee in the, well, a bit less these days, but, uh, you know, coffee in the, um, in, in the college and uh, chit chat here and there when, when is needed, really. Yeah, I think that's really true. I think like your tutor is a lot more of a point of contact kind of to do with those sort of things than necessarily just someone that kind of teaches you. And I think that's really nice because it kind of adds to that support network, I think, um, throughout kind of your years at uni. Um, and we also have had previously in our college, um, and I guess it might depend on different colleges, but we did like punting um, with our tutors and like the other engineers in our college, which is really nice because you kind of then get to interact a lot with people in other year groups, as well as maybe tutors that you haven't had before, but you might have in the future. And so it's quite a nice way of having some informal contact um, with kind of people that are interested in similar things, I guess. Um, and I, so think, I think, nice. well, the, the punting example look, looks looks like a bit of an anecdote, but it, we have the same actually in St. Hughes, but it, it really is what it is about. It's about cohort building. And, and I, I always tend to tell that to the students we welcome in our college, and I'm sure it's, it's done throughout the university, that the years that perform best in a college are when the students within the cohort are working together, are you know, collaborating together, are discussing, discussing question sheet together. Um, if you go on your own and as you know work individually and do not interact with anybody which, which you can possibly do in a college frankly um, then you're you are losing on this interaction and uh, with you know there's quite a fair amount of work to be done in and for the department and for the college so um, this, this social aspect uh, is is more than just having fun. It's also about uh, uh, working together and understanding a topic together and helping each other. And I, I think that, that that's quite important. Um, but Beth will have her own opinion as a student, I guess. But Yeah, no, I can definitely second that. I think there's a lot more of a support network within the year groups and your own year group with kind of doing problem sets and things like that. Because like, I know people in the year above that have been like, oh, if you're like really stuck at some point, like feel free to come and like talk to me because they're obviously like engineering kind of is fundamental throughout and so like a lot of things that they're doing they'll be developing on that and so them kind of coming back and helping revisit you in like first year or second year content isn't annoying for them it's something that they've done and that they're developing on and so you're kind of it is a very friendly environment I think um, and everyone's kind of like happy to help um, and so that is a really nice thing um, that I've found for sure. Um, so yeah, we've had another question saying, even if it's a general engineering course, could one specialize in robotics? 
Well, I mean, uh, Beth will confirm, but uh, it is a general engineering course, right? Which means that, uh, especially the first couple of years, you, you'll be taught everything, all right? Well, everything, a bit of everything. Uh, and you, you, you know, you work on mechanics of materials, you work on control engineering, uh, you, you do a bit of, of, of everything. And uh, the third and special, particular the fourth year, you'll be asked to pick options uh and those are about the kind of stuff you want to specialize in so indeed it could be robotics um it could be any anything you want but essentially um uh, it is about giving you uh some kind of a, a bunch of building blocks of different topics and areas to help you make an informed decision when you go toward this third and fourth year but still have a general background uh at the end of of, of your diploma uh, is it is it a fair assessment, Beth, from from your perspective? Yeah, I'd say so. I think um, I really enjoyed the general aspect of the first two years because I think it's meant that I've done topics that I wouldn't have necessarily thought of doing, but I have actually really enjoyed. Um, and so when we go on to specialise in third and fourth year, there are definitely options in which you can go down like machine learning and things like that. Um, and so if that's something that you're interested in, then that can definitely happen, but it's just slightly later down the line. Um, but if there are things that you're really interested in, like robotics, for example, they do have different societies and getting involved in things like that can be really good um, and good fun to get some kind of like hands on experience, I guess, um, in those areas, because a lot of them are student led. So you can properly get involved. Um, and so kind of doing things like that is definitely an option right from when you joined uni. It doesn't have to just be, I think, in the last two years. Um, and so that is a really good thing, um, I would say. But I think there's a question that comes next, but I'll probably let you answer that one because you're the one that <laughs> spent those, those hours in the workshop and lab. So question is uh, for the audience, what percentage of your time do you spend in workshop or, or lab? So in first year, we had five hours of labs um, a week. And so that was all in one day. Um, and we did like lots of different things like computing, electrical kind of, we did a little music box thing. Um, and so that was probably, I guess, one day a week. Um, and in terms of the amount of time we'd spend on other things, I guess we had a couple of hour tutorials, um, about eight to 10 hours of lectures, and then two problem sheets that took approximately, were meant to take about 10 hours each. And so kind of, you can work out the percentage of that. <laughs> but yeah, I think we did like a, a, a good amount um, in first year and then second year has been slightly less. But when you go into third and fourth year, you spend a lot of time doing your third year project and your fourth year project, which I think there's more information about on the websites so that might be worth checking out if you're interested. Um, and so that's probably when you get to spend more time necessarily kind of in the kind of lab environment working on a particular project. Um, I think what's been really good as well in second year is we didn't have as many labs um, during term time, um, but we finished our exams partway through this last term and have then done some coursework modules, um, which has meant spending kind of a whole week um, doing some different projects that we picked. Um, and so that's been really good, really good as well. So I'd say the most of your time is spent kind of doing problem sheets and um, kind of tutorials and that kind of side of things, but there definitely is lab time. Um, that you get to do those kind of projects and throughout your degree the more you get to pick them like first year we didn't have any choices in which labs we did um, but this year we got to pick some coursework modules and I'm currently in the process of picking my third year project now and will again for fourth year um, and so yeah the options are definitely there um, which is really and then good. as you say the fourth year project is going to be uh, another opportunity to get immersed in a more research environment so Fourth year project essentially what happened is that at the end of the third year, which is pretty much now for you, Beth, uh, you I uh, know no, you're in second, so it's going to be next year. Uh, you'd have to pick essentially um, a set of um, uh, you'd be offered a bunch of project research project embedded into some of the research group in the department, and you have to pick some that you want. And obviously, depending on what you're going to be doing, uh, you'll be asked to perform research. Uh, along with PhD student and postdoc and and you know and whatnot in in the different groups, in which case you know if you work on an AI project, well you will be spending time in front of a computer. But if you work on a, um, I don't know a wind turbine 
uh, a project, then you'd end up speaking, uh, spending time in a lab uh, working, uh, working in this. So there'll be plenty of opportunities for, for more uh, hands-on um, hands work, uh, particularly for fourth-year uh, project in the context of, of research, essentially. Yes, for sure. And I think I know a couple of people as well um, who decided that they wanted to propose their own fourth year project, um, which is also quite cool. So if there's something really specific that you want to go into, even if it's not on the list, it's something that you can potentially propose if you find um, someone to kind of be your mentor with it. Um, and so obviously that's quite far down the line, but it's still an option, um, which is really quite good, I think. Um, so, yeah, we've had another question saying, what are you looking for at interview? It's a, it's a good question. It's obviously coming back quite, quite often. Um, uh, essentially, what the, uh, so, you know, you get a PAT score, you get a UCAS uh, form with a personal statement, and all of this gives you only that much about an individual. Um, what the interview uh, help us assessing, essentially, is uh, the way that the individual, the, the candidate, interacts fa when faced with you know, a problem, a question, the way the candidate's gonna think about it. Uh, and there's no, quite often those are open questions. There's, sometimes there's no right or wrong or there's no specific number. It's all about how you discuss the problem, what tools you're going to be using, how you're going to be using those tools. Um, and sometimes it involves asking, uh, asking about more detail about this or about that so that it helps you. Um, solving the problem that you're being asked. So it, it's very much about the interaction more than the, you know, seven megapascal or, you know, three Newton at the end of, of the question. Uh, did, did you feel Beth, that it was, it had been a bit along the same line when you, when you did your interview? Yeah, definitely. I think I, I hadn't necessarily had um, much experience before with kind of any practice interviews or necessarily the idea of like speaking what you're thinking out loud. Um, but I kind of, I think, very quickly realised in the interview that the more I was saying what I was thinking, the kind of better it went, because it just became a lot more of a discussion and a lot more kind of like you were working it out together in a way. So it felt like less pressure. And it, I think, obviously, it must help the tutors in some way, because it means they know what's going on in your head rather than you just sitting there being like, I have no idea. Like, you're not necessarily expected to just look at the question and be like, oh, yeah, I've got it. Um, and so I think keeping that in mind can be really useful from like a student experience point of view as well when you have the interview. Um, yeah, and so it's quite often actually along the same line, we ask the candidate to write down or to voice out the, the way they're doing. So it's not that you're being asked a question and you're supposed to say seven and that's the end of the interview, right? Uh, the idea is to kind of walk through it and indeed, as you say, uh, voicing out what you're thinking uh, and sometimes it's just to realize that what you're thinking is not the right way. And then you can backtrack and then put another hypothesis and work it out again. And that's fine. Uh, that's what that's what we want to see to some extent. Yeah, definitely. I would agree. Um, so we've had another question. Um, it says, while supervising students, what did you notice is the most effective, efficient way for students to remember engineering concepts? Should you focus on solving problems? practice problems um, or is it worth going into depth with reading and making notes? Oh, I mean, I don't know what Beth has to think. I think that's very much a personal way of working. I mean, some people have photographic memory. I do. Uh, and I'd have to kind of remember how it was organized in the course to remember, you know, how this thing works or how I should solve that problem. Um, whereas uh, some people would need to work it out and then do it again and again and again until it just goes in, you know, in your brain, essentially. Uh, I'd say it's very much personal. Uh, I don't think there's a, a, magic, um, a magic formula. I mean, I don't know how you work, Beth. But... Yeah, I think I find, like, I have a form of dyslexia, and so reading in-depth notes is not going to be very efficient for me. Like, I can, I can do it, but, like, we're not going to get very far. Um, and so I find kind of looking through kind of syllabus specification and making sure that I kind of know everything that I'm meant to know and then just kind of practicing loads of problems I find most useful like efficiency wise I think um, because then I know that I should know everything and so it's just like understanding what the questions are asking and how it wants me to kind of like think about the problems 
Um, and so, yeah, it is very, um, very personal things. I know a lot of people that do just write loads of notes and have like lots of color coded kind of like diagrams and stuff like that. And that works for them. Um, and I think also when you come to uni, it's a really good idea, like wherever you go to kind of remember what works for you and not get put off by what other people are doing. Because I remember I in first year when I had a kind of like prelim exam. So they're like the kind of exams you have at the end of first year. Um, I remember being a little bit put off because I was like, wow, OK, everyone's made so many notes and I'm, I am I haven't. And like, does that mean that I'm not prepared? Like, is that everything going to be OK? But obviously you just got to do what method works for you. And that worked for me and whatever they were doing worked for them. So kind of don't get put off by that. Um, but that also means sometimes experiencing different methods, right? And, and mm -hmm. that's what also what tutorials help you achieve because you're not, it helps you understand how you need to work or how you personally work. Uh, but there's two things that are quite clear to me is that uh, just reading the lectures and thinking that's it is not going to work. What if, you know, there's going to be more work that's required in, in the background. And two, uh, as I said earlier, I think the collaborative aspect of working out a question sheet and discussing problem with, with other students is also something that's going to that's gonna help uh, in the short term as much as in the long term. As, as, as far as I can see from my, my own duty, uh, and probably Beth will have her own view on this, but I think probably not that far. Yeah, I think um, for some people, like the kind of adjustment to the tutorial system is quite a big one because you sort of go from maybe sitting in a classroom and kind of like being told information um, to then kind of actually having such kind of one on one contact almost kind of going through the questions and like working with someone um, and so I think that is something that people have to adjust to but I don't really know anyone that has said that they don't find tutorials useful I don't think I found anyone say that they've not been like the best way that they've had actually learning because it's such a kind of like hands-on approach um, and so yeah I guess it's what works for you but usually the tutorial system on the whole I think is ingenious <laughs> um, and so that's always a good thing um we just had another question saying should you choose a college based on which tutor you want to work with well i'll give my answer but i think it's kind of most likely it's more going to be for beth to answer that one but i think it's a difficult question because colleges have different culture and different, uh, you know, they work slightly differently. There's a different atmosphere, depending whether you're in one college or another one. And I'm not saying there's a one good and one bad. I'm just saying it's slightly different. Uh, obviously, I discovered all of this once I arrived and I was already a, a Saint Hughes uh, a tutor. So there's a lot of it that you can't just know beforehand. Um, the, uh, now, picking a, picking a college as a function of the tutor, I, I would probably not think that's the way to go because tutor can move or, or and you don't necessarily know how tutor in my uh, how a tutor is it might be the you know one of the greatest researcher ever and actually somebody that doesn't have much time to interact with you once you're in the college so you, you don't I wouldn't say there's a there's a right or wrong if you know a bit about the colleges and you you know you you have some belief that one fits better your way of thinking or being um, then, then go for it uh, and if you don't, well, I wouldn't worry too, too much about which college you pick. As a matter of fact, you can decide not to pick any college when you apply. Uh, and meaning that one will be will be given to you uh, if you're offered a place. Um, uh, Beth, what, what's your view on this? Yeah, I think another thing to keep in mind is like what college you pick isn't necessarily the college that you'll get allocated to, even if you do get a place. Um, and so like there's not too much pressure on that decision um, and so I think that's something that's good to keep in mind but yeah I think when I was looking at colleges I looked a lot at like the website to try and get an idea for like the different college websites to get to see kind of what their ethos was because I think I really wanted to look at quite what would seem like a kind of inclusive and welcoming college and that would be like a really nice place to live because obviously you're going to be there for however many years even if you're not living on site you're kind of part of that community um, and so there are lots of different things though, that people will look for kind of like whether they get all years in college um, accommodation, um, whether it's catered. A lot of the colleges are catered accommodation, but it's still something to like worth checking for um, and things like that. And obviously, when you arrive, 
you can still contact tutors if it's an area you're particularly interested in like there's no reason why what college you're at should kind of stop that necessarily being a thing and so yeah I wouldn't worry too much about kind of picking the college based on the tutor I feel like there are other things that are worth looking for um, personally as well but yeah um how much material science is covered in the engineering course would you say well first of all there is a department of material science in the university of oxford right so if there is a if if as a candidate you're absolutely passionate about material science and not necessarily the engineering aspect the more applied to it um uh yeah the more applied version of it uh i'd say uh then potentially material science is what 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 you want uh, now, as I we said earlier, right, it's a general uh, engineering course. So you will do materials engineering uh, to some extent. You do mechanics of material, but you will do equally, um, you know, uh, software engineering or control engineering or civil engineering. So uh, I'd say if if you want to do absolutely material science and you're not interested in anything else then you know go for the department of material science if the engineering aspect the applied aspect the uh and and also the understanding of what the other fields are all about within engineering is what is inter it was of interest and i'd say you know the department of engineering science is, is, is what what you want um beth how did you feel that i mean how much materials or mechanics of material did you feel that there was i mean there was maybe a false at the beginning and it, it, it goes less and less, I think, huh? depending yeah. on the options you take, I guess. Yeah, I guess it depends on your options because there are definitely options you can take that will mean that you're doing more materials. Um, I've really enjoyed the materials modules we've had so far. And so we've definitely covered um, a decent amount, I would say. Um, but again, there's also things that you can do to kind of get more involved, like kind of looking at lab work with materials, if that's something that you really want to do. Um, like over the summers and things like that um, and so there are obviously like lots of options of things that you can do to kind of go further into it even if the course isn't necessarily um, specifically catering for it but we've definitely covered some material science so far and going into third year um, I will definitely be like looking at doing more of that and so it is an option for sure um, and so yeah we've had another question that says is the workload in first year the same as the one expected in a French class preparatoire if I pronounce. almost there uh, <laughs> uh, yeah so I mean I guess it's a it's a question that's very specific for, for people coming from the, the French system um, uh, so the the French system is very heavy in in math and physics in those class preparatoires and it prepares you to engineering uh, that I went through this system um, uh, I'd say, I'd say, yes, I'd say there's, it's, 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 it's very different. I, I don't want to spend too much time on this because it, it is very different system, uh, but both involve quite a lot of work. I mean, there's no question about it. Um, the University of Oxford is, there's an entire community and social envir environment that helps you as you work during those three or four years. Uh, but uh, it's there also to help you because you learn a lot, because you get exposed to tons of things. Uh, so so it, it, is, it is a lot of work. You know, comparing both systems, I'm not sure it's very valid, but if the question is, are we gonna work a lot? Uh, I think the answer, Beth will probably answer the same, but I think, I think the answer is yes. Um, yeah, there is quite a lot of work. And if you want to do other things as well, though, you can make time, like you can make a good balance of it for sure. Um, but there's no point coming thinking you're not going to be working because if you enjoy it, then that's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, you probably, you want that balance, right, Beth? I mean, you, you, you want to have something to take your mind off that, you know, those, those that, you know, freaking mechanics that you can't <laughs> do anymore or whatever you're doing at the time. Uh, but it's fair to say that you're not going to be able to, you know, roll, bas do basketball, football, tennis, uh, theater, uh, build your own new company, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end, do a bit of, of uh, study in, in this bachelor or master. Uh, there's, there's a balance to reach, uh, I think. Yeah, for sure. I think a balance is extremely important and it's good to have some things that you prioritize time to, um, to make sure that you have that balance. Um, and so, yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Um, we just had another question saying what links do Oxford have 
with industry? Um, well, that's a very good question, actually. Well, there's, there's a lot of links uh, at, at all level. First, because we are, uh, at least at the academic level, we're, we're, we're doing research. And some research is, you know, is uh, uh, fundamental research. That's not, does not necessarily apply to the industrial world uh, that obviously, at least. But a lot of it is funded by the industry. A lot of it is in collaboration with industry. So uh, academics do interact with the industry quite heavily. Um, then uh, the student gets also uh, lots of opportunities to, to collaborate with the with the industry. I think you guys are being offered. I mean, Beth, please confirm. But I think you, there's uh, quite a lot of internship offer um, uh, during the summer. Uh, and then obviously, as you get toward the end of your degree, uh, you know, you, you, have to you have to start looking for a job uh, or your next step, at least in your life. And then quite a lot of opportunity to discuss with the industry will, will be open to you. But I think that's more for Beth to, to, to answer. Yeah, I would say that the career service is really, really good here. Like there, you can easily book appointments for free just to have a chat about literally like anything to do with like applications to something that they've got internships for or like just reading your cv and things like that so the support is definitely is definitely there and there is not a shortfall of opportunity um for sure um okay so we are coming to the end of time so we just have a final question um which i think we can both answer but if anton you want to answer first um what tips do you have to students applying to oxford so i don't think there's a right or wrong right you, you can't uh, I think be yourself. That's the most important thing. Uh, the, the big mistake is uh, to, in particular, to write to the interview and essentially freeze because of, of stress. Uh, you want to be yourself. You want to have a nice conversation uh, and, and then work out a problem of interest. And that's what we, we, we want to have. So I'd say uh, no, no point stressing out just being yourself and then trying to have a nice conversation and, and sharing your passion for what you're applying for. Um, that'd, be, that'd be my, my, uh, my advice. Yeah, I would massively agree with that. I think it's also a really good thing to keep in mind that like at the end of the day, like the outcome doesn't really matter too much. Like you will end up doing like really cool things. And so don't let the kind of the value be whether you get a place or not like it's completely not really up to you you just have to kind of do the application and just like see what happens I think there were definitely points before applying when I was looking at the PAP test and I was just like oh I'm not sure I can do this is there literally any point me bothering applying but I my mum was just like just try it like you've wanted to try it just go for it and then see what happens and obviously like it worked out somehow like we got here um, and so just yeah don't be put off I would say and don't put too much pressure pressure on yourself um, because all you can do is as Antoine said just be yourself and talk about what you enjoy doing um, and so yeah I think we will kind of bring this to a close but students will be around um, to answer questions on Slido until four um, and so if you have any more questions just like ask away on that and then we'll also have some more live streams tomorrow um, at 12 I think there's a Q&A for students and then at two there's a tutors Q&A um, again a bit like this one so um, yeah I hope that you have a good end of your uh, virtual open day and you can go on the website and there'll be more um, information um, on there as well um, if you're wanting to apply for this year. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you very Hopefully. much. Good luck everyone. Yeah, have a good rest of your virtual open day. <laughs> Bye.